I have the bad habit of changing my talk in the last minute, and I was very inspired by Tim Hunt uh, speaking about discovery. So I will switch a little and try to explain to you how to make a discovery. And uh, I, I, I wish that when I was a young student, I would have known what I know today. I've been, as you heard, uh, a part of the machinery selecting Nobel laureates. So I know what you should do. And um, <laughs> we heard from Tim uh, about uh, mistakes, the wilderness, and so on. And uh, uh, if I just start with these two gentlemen in Cambridge, who that were. Amazing, both were that, that's right. <laughs> So, I, so have I, but I've, uh, I've not won a single Nobel Prize yet. <laughs> uh, what they discovered, actually, was not a detailed structure. Today, you need to know exactly where all the atoms are, and sometimes that doesn't help. Of course, a, seeing a structure, seeing a bicycle, for instance, makes it possible for you to deduce how it functions. Without knowing how it looks, you can't deduce function. So they discovered the, the important principles of the double helix. One strand, you see these small arrows here, one strand running in this way and the other way this way, and combined by base pairs. And they found that the number of Cs were identical to the number of Gs. And the number of As were identical to the number of Ts. So from that, they deduced that they were attached to each other. But that was a, an educated guess. They really didn't know. But they postulated that with this famous structure, which, by the way, is drawn by this Francis Crick, the genius of the two, I would say, wife. So what I will speak to you about is a discovery we made uh, just a couple of years ago, and where I will test on you whether you think it might be important. It might be worth a Nobel Prize if uh, we can show that it has some biological function. So we demonstrated by pulling single molecules of DNA that there is a very defined, very well-defined conformation which is stretched, and it's quite strongly stretched. 51% longer than original, OK? Francis Crick would have been very happy to discuss this, I'm sure. The, exactly the same degree of extension is also found in DNA when it is subject to interaction with so-called recombinases. And these are very important enzymes that carry out uh, the moving around of the genes in bacteria, actually introducing intelligent mutations in bacteria. Bacteria can mutate. They can change themselves so they escape discovery. They escape uh, treatment of antibiotics and so on. So for bacteria, this is really very important. In humans or higher organisms, we, there is a very similar protein that carries out the uh, uh, combination of mother's and father's genes. That's also very important. That's the kind of mutation you have, the sexual mutation. So we propose, because of the similarity, that uh, this is not a coincidence. Uh, Sherlock Holmes said he didn't believe in coincidences, and nor do I. So I think there may be something in this conformation. A lot of people have stretched DNA before, but not as precisely as we did, and not with a defined sequence. So what we end up is a possibility that normal DNA, which is the Watson Crick DNA here, is stretched either inhomogeneously like this, or homogeneously like that. OK? Uh, and this. Uh, means that you have three base pairs that are aligned uh, uh, approximately perpendicular to the helix axis, just like in B-form DNA. And then there is a big gap. 
This is an unfavorable structure because this air, or water to be precise, between destabilizes the helix. The bases want to be stacked like coins in a coin pile, okay? This is slightly more stable because here the, the bases are tilted but still in contact with each other. And the big question is which of this is the true thing? Uh, we could look at energies and it turns out that the energy we see when we pull, when we see this change, when we pull, we can measure the force. So we can calculate the force times the distance. And that's energy. And this energy turns out to be 4.5 kilocalories per mole of these gaps. And that's roughly what you expect from uh, experimental knowledge, from melting experiments. We don't trust uh, computations. The theory is too shaky to be, but we trust experiments. So we are in the right ballpark. Two plus two is roughly four, normally. <laughs> now we come to, into the biology, and as you have heard from Tim, it's quite complex. It's always complex because biology has evolved for a long, long time by polishing on various mechanisms. And it's difficult for humans to understand exactly what's happening. So rec -A, as I said, in bacteria, it mediates homologous recombination essential for maintaining the genomic integrity and for generating genetic diversity, what I called intelligent mutations. It has nothing to do with intelligent design. It's just that the mutations are not just hay wild, it's systematic. What happens is that this protein, Rec A, binds to a single strand of DNA. That's the first thing that happens. The second step is that once you have formed a fibrous complex like this, a second DNA, a double-stranded DNA, comes in and joins the company. And then a magic happens. Nobody really understands what happens. And uh, I used to like to hear, uh, quest uh, hear lectures when the lecturer said that we don't understand this, because then I thought that maybe I could contribute somehow here. Okay. So then something happens. So one of the strands of the double helix change places with the single strand, and out you get something that, where you have uh, changed how the DNA runs. How does this connect to, uh, and it's much more complicated, ATP is there, and ATP <coughs> is needed for the binding here, but uh, it's also needed for uh, hydrolyzing, it goes over to ADP and then something happens, so that's also important. And also all kinds of uh, ions, the magnesium ion and calcium ions, they have different roles, which we begin to, to understand and uh, they, it looks like something like that, the DNA is here and then there is a lot of protein, you know, and here we have the magnesium and ATP. We discover just by accident, and this is what happens in the lab sometimes. You look for something and you discover something. And then uh, you have to be smart. You, you have to uh, not say that it's probably wrong. You have to look into it and you have to accept it when you can reproduce it. You should not sweep it under the carpet. That's rule number one for you if you are going to continue and become scientists. When you see something odd, you, uh, you should not be uh, uh, mad at it. You should not be uh, sad. You should be happy. And what my student, Bobo Feng, found just two years ago, actually we published it two years ago, he found it earlier, was that if you had a double helix of DNA, some 20 base pairs, and you added a single strand which was identical to one of the strands here, exactly the same sequence, you could see a spontaneous uh, exchange. It only works to 50% because statistically when half of it is ha here and half there, it, it, the reaction stops. But you could look at the kinetics and normally in water it took a long time, 30,000 seconds. Okay. But if you added polyethylene glycol, which is this molecule, uh, 
it went faster and faster and faster. And suddenly, a, a big jump when you had 50% polyethylene glycol, it was 500 seconds. And this became 10 times faster when you went, went from 50 to 52. This was really puzzling. And you just try to remember this. We will return to it. What, what happened, really? I indicated here something call, I call hydrophobic catalysis. But hydrophobic, how many knows what hydrophobic is? Hand up. One, two, three, four, five. Tim, good. Six, <laughs> seven. But that's good. I, I, I think the rest of you are just shy enough to. Uh, this will be the red thread through my talk today, hydrophobicity and the biological role of it, which I think has been overseen. So this may be the discovery. It's up to you to judge. 1976, I did another experiment as a young student. Um, no, I was actually associate professor at that time. Um, I started earlier. Uh, I found that if I had benzoic acid, this is benzoic acid in a water solution, and I dipped into it a, a bag of polyethylene, just a, a, a polymer, all or a big part of the, the benzoic acid went into the film. It was just against intuition. This is partly hydrophobic molecule, and it's easily solvable in water. However, it could form a rather strong dimer by through two hydrogen bonds here. Okay? So the molecule is dissolvable in water because of the polar oxygen and the polar hydroxyl group here, which water could uh, bind to and dissolve it. But if you have another molecule and it forms a dimer, it is essentially hydrophobic, both because you shield the charges here, you even uh, decompose, you, you compensate the permanent dipole moment, which is in this direction, with an opposite dipole moment. And these things make it completely unpolar and dissolvable in polyethylene or any hydrophobic solvent. It goes easily into a cell membrane, by the way. But we recognize two hydrogen bonds between two groups. That's what we have in the This is a Swedish stamp celebrating the 1962 Nobel Prize to Crick, Watson, and Wilkins, by the way. And you see the double helix here, wonderfully colored. The principle of two hydrogen bonds you have here in the AT. Adenine is bound to thymine to through two hydrogen bonds. And the point I want to make is that a lot of people, including Watson and Crick, didn't understand that this, is, this stability is provided you have it in a very special environment. Because this molecule, the total dimer, is much less polar. So it would like to be in a hydrophobic environment. That's what I postulate. GC, the same thing. And uh, Watson and Crick thought it was two hydrogen bonds in both cases, and they couldn't really understand why G preferred C. They thought it looked like this. That's from the 1953 paper. Uh, they missed this hydrogen bond. It's obvious. You should have seen it immediately if you looked at this, and you could have to told them. They didn't know much chemistry. Crick was a physicist, and Watson was a bird watcher. So uh, chemistry is good to have. That's, we, we have the molecule in the center in molecular frontiers, OK? So don't forget the chemistry. There was a lady also, Rosalind Franklin, who unfortunately died. She should have shared the prize. That's my thinking. She is behind photograph 51, which is the diffraction, x-ray diffraction photo of stretched fibers of DNA. And the cross here tells you that you are dealing with a helix. That was essentially all information they used. We have a helix, and we have A equal to T and G equal to C. That made Watson and Crick postulate that, that famous structure. 
We also, many years ago, uh, discovered a helix. Uh, Masayuki Takahashi, stand up. <laughs> yes. He was in my lab, and uh, he was a senior scientist already then. He was very senior. I was, uh, I was his assistant. And we uh, used neutrons from a nuclear reactor to study neutron scattering. And, and you see the neutron scattering pattern we saw here. You see the cross here, which tells you that we are dealing with a helix. Now we have proteins that are sc the scattering elements. They provide a helix. And this is a, an aligned sample. We had a cell of niobium that my technician had constructed. And we were spinning that. And when we rotated it rather fast, all the molecules were aligned. It was a difficult experiment. I, I did the washing up, you know. And uh, uh, it was difficult several times until, uh, since I didn't have so much water, this was a, a laboratory for physicists. And they, they were no, uh, uh, no kitchen, no water. But I had a little beer. And when I poured the beer, and washed the cell with a beer. We got fantastic results, right? Yes. yes. We still don't know why, but we got very good orientation here. When we calculated the neutron spectrum, the spectrum you should expect, we, we got this if you have perfect orientation. This is the degree of orientation. So th there is no orientation at all here. Then you should see just circles. But we saw something very clearly aligned. And we could say that. Probably the orientation factor is 0.4. It was also observed, not by us, but by others, that the DNA was elongated. So that could be put into this picture. <coughs> DNA was elongated by a factor of 1.5. To this day, we still don't understand why it needs to be elongated. But maybe we will approach it to, during my talk. We also measured something called linear diacritism. That is the absorption of polarized UV light. And at 260 nanometer, the DNA base is absorbed light. And this negative peak here is indicative of that the bases are preferentially perpendicular to the helix axis. But we didn't know exactly until we could use the S value from the neutron experiment to put into this formula. You put in 0.4 here. You put in the LD and the absorbance. And out you get the angle between the bases and the helix axis. And it turns out to be close to 90 degrees. So the bases are sitting perpendicular to the helix axis. We saw that already in 28 years ago. We published it. But we couldn't make sense of it. It clearly, today, when we know about the two structures here, it clearly eliminates this structure. That would have given even a positive linear diagram, by the way. But almost 90 degrees is what we have in DNA B form, and also in this triplet with proportionated B DNA, as we call it. So we could exclude that. And today, we know that our answer was correct. The DNA structure inside the Recade double-stranded DNA filament looks something like that, according to a, a recent crystal structure. Again, we don't understand the gap. Now comes Niklas' discovery, a student of mine who found doing very careful single molecule studies on very well-defined DNA, where all the bases were defined and where the DNA was not very long, just some 60 or 70 base pairs, we found that tension induces a base pair overstrecked DNA conformation. That was against, people had looked at this 20 years earlier, but not found anything. They found denaturation, that the bases went apart. This is Niklas, and this is the, his machine. I will not. Uh, explain it in detail. There are two lasers, and you use the power of the uh, refraction here. That's the refractive index that transmits photons through glass, the same kind of thing. And it gives rise to a reaction force that 
could control this bead. And by this, he could measure forces on the piconewton scale and distance, the nanometer scale of single molecules, single molecules of DNA. Machine looks like that. One bead is attached to a pipette here. The other bead is focused in the laser trap, the laser tweezers. And the DNA is short, around 20 nanometers. And you could move this bead away, that's on this scale, and you could measure the force, it's on this scale. And within two days, we had a remarkable, amazing discovery. Extended DNA conformation, 51% longer, by stability at 63 piconewton. And it was a 60 base pair long duplex DNA that we used. So there is no reaction with glyoxo, which means that the, bases are, the base pairs are intact. And you could increase the distance, and you could measure the force. And at a certain force, it's jumping back and forth like this. You could follow this with time. And you could position yourself just at the magic point here and even do a population analysis, which gives you so-called thermodynamic parameters. And you could plot uh, the, the, the stretching probability against the force like this. And it was beautiful results. You could also make an energy landscape. Normal B DNA, Watson Crick DNA, it has its structure here. And uh, thermally, if you heat the sample up, four kilocalories is the activation energy you need to go over here. That will never, ever happen. You need to stretch the DNA. And when the DNA is stretched, you are over here. So in that way, sense, you could overcome this activation energy. So suddenly, we had understanding on a mechanical level of what happens when you take a single DNA molecule and pull it. But we didn't know, is this useful for anything? That was our question. And of course, we wanted it to be. As a young student, I loved to answer questions. But most of the questions I answered were unimportant questions. And the question is, was this another, yet another unimportant question? Okay. We did this all, all kinds of, uh, we could put in covalent linkers, and we went on. It was very important to show that our discovery was really waterproof. You know, a lot of people uh, attacked us and said, this is good. But when we published it in PNAS, uh, PNAS, a very nice journal, American journal, it was with flying colors. Everything was waterproof. So this is essentially what happens. Uh, the bead here is moved up by the laser, and then uh, the, the DNA is opened here. First it's stretched, and then it's denatures open. So we follow it up there, go over to the newt, and then here it, it's denatures. So that's if you have GC-rich construct. If you have very little GC and AT, the picture is different. Then you see what everybody has seen before, uh, and you, you get a, a denaturation of the DNA every time, no stretching at all. So this, in a nutshell, was our discovery. So we had to also add glyoxal to convince ourselves that not some of the bases had opened, but all were staying, that the conformation was a double-stranded conformation. It could have been still interesting, but we we were unsure. So when we added glyoxal, uh, we get the product here if there is an open base. But this product is not seen otherwise. And we could show that the conclusion based, still based us, because this didn't happen. So what we think happens is the following. We have the normal DNA with the stacked bases. And it becomes extended, 50% extended when we stretch it. And then that something magic happens. We get this disproportionation. That's what we postulate. Three bases stacked. That's about 10 angstrom. Big gap, about 5 angstrom. Three bases stacked. Big gap, and so on. 
The crystal structure of RECA in, in uh, double-stranded DNA supports this model. And we believe that these three base packages are important. We don't know yet, I just postulate that they are important. And this is uh, paraphrasing what Watson and Crick said in their 1953 paper. They say, it has not escaped our notice that our structure could provide a mechanism for copying. So I copied that text here. So the genetic code is also based on triplets. And, and my colleagues, they got hiccups when I said that. This has nothing to do with the genetic code. Why? Why not? You know, in uh, the complex with the uh, messenger RNA, tRNA ribosome complex that Ada Yonat spoke about uh, in her movie, uh, three bases uh, of mRNA matching the anticode on tRNA uh, at the P site. So there is a stacking. So the anticode on bases appear to stack in some crystal structures also in, fr in free DNA. So is this really a coincidence, or does three come from the physics of the DNA or RNA rather than from the combinatorial demands of protein diversity. But that's the subject of another lecture. So I will leave that subject. It, you could think about it. We also studied the RAD51 structure and were fortunate by doing something we call uh, site-specific linear dichroism. That means that you replace one amino acid at the time of the protein, uh, 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 an aromatic amino acid like tyrosine with a transparent one. And so if you have a transparent one, the difference in spectra will be that due to this very uh, tyrosine. And from that, we had a puzzle which we could, with some eight or 10 tyrosine, figure out the a structure of RAD51 DNA. And this structure is quite similar to the crystal structure found with REC A. If I should be honest, we, we, uh, we were inspired by that because we looked at it. But this is the true structure that we get from the linear dichroism, um, which tells you that it's important with, um, with the structure methods, where you could see structure in solution which you can with linear dichroism. We could compare it with electron microscopy uh, mapping. It's quite similar. We, we could, this is our structure put inside an EM picture. And there are also systematic results from mutation analysis that supports our structure. We got almost no citations of our structure of the RAD51. Uh, I think nobody either did not understand what we had done. That's, the, that's most probably because the LD was complicated, the mathematical analysis was complicated, or they didn't care. Because RAD51, as the groups here at Tokyo Tech know, it's a very difficult system. There are many questions, many remaining questions. It's very important because understanding it will tell you how uh, the genetic uh, search for homology works and the replacement. These are very important processes. So we can just speculate about the biological roles of stretch DNA. We think that three stacked bases in B conformation is the minimum stable construct. And that has to do with hydrophobic stacking. You can't have too many surfaces exposed to water. So either you have two, or you have three, or you have four uh, bases stacked. It's impossible to have five and then a gap, because then the strains are, are too high on the backbone. So we end up with three. Perpendicular bases could provide a critical base pairing in search for homology. Just like in the Watson Crick system, where the base pairing is served to, co to preserve the DNA rather than recognize the DNA. The self-recognition is just uh, uh, the maximum way of preserving the genetic information. 
It's first when you read off the structure, the recognition is important. It's still sufficiently unstable to dissociate when mission is completed, when you have done your gene transfer. That may be the important answer to the question, why stretched? Which is still an open question. It could also be an energy source, like a rubber band. If you have stretched it, it could deliver some free energy, which you may need to dissociate the complex. So here you have, this is hypothetical. It's guesses. There could be question marks after all of them. This is something, um, it's enough for all of you to look at this. It, you, you could use that as your research project. Now we should do an experiment here. How much time do I have? Oh, that's plenty of time. So now you could work. Now I want to do like once Francis Crick, who said, big questions get big answers. So we should ask some big questions. I have several. I have genetic code, a detailed machinery for how it evolved, the origin, the beginning. These proteins are very old. Rec A is probably one of the oldest proteins in the world. So it has been there from the beginning, very important for evolution. And it sits on secrets. I want to address this question. Role of water for life. You know, I, I get thirsty when I think about this. But you know we have to drink. You know that plants have to be watered. But why? Wake up. I want some answer. Come with some, some uh, proposal. Why, why is it like that? Why do organisms, well, whether bacteria, plants, higher beings, need water? And quite a lot of water. Come on. Yeah. Yes? You, you raised your hand, or it was just itching your hand? Yeah. OK. Somebody, come, come with some suggestion. Yeah? We need water. Water is polarized, so we need water to make the chemistry. Yes, you need it in chemistry. So as a solvent, you need water, because it's it's, pol it's polar, and it could be used to dissolve ionic things. We heard from Ada about sodium chloride. It could dissolve both the so sodium and the chloride ion. That's not the answer, but it's one answer. I have 10 more minutes now? OK, thanks. More, more suggestions. Yes? Uh, we have transporting. The blood is transporting. What, what does it transport? What's blood transporting? Two, two big things. The oxygen and the... Nutri nutrition agents. That's uh, as a f primitive physical chemist. That CO2. And CO2. You have to get rid of the CO2. Right. Good. Sit down. <laughs> More? It's not what I'm after. Yes? Could, could you say, speak? Speak in the microphone. Speak loud. I think you need water to cool your body down. So okay. So yeah. That's right. You sweat. The dogs <laughs> do like that with their tongue. I haven't thought about that. That's good. I get more suggestions every day. Yeah. Yes. We need water for many reactions in our cells. Correct. The, uh, the all electron reactions, the uh, uh, 
in the photosynthesis and so on. This, yes. There was one more there. Yes. We need we need it for hydrolysis, like every That's chemical right. reaction. Absolutely. It, as as the word said, hydrolysis. Yes, lubrication. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have to accelerate. Uh, th this was part of the question time, so I continue. <laughs> so we have an intelligent supramolecular structure here. And we know how DNA recognizes itself, if we may call it like that. But this recognition only works in a dry environment. If you have a lot of water, the water would bind here, and you wouldn't have any strong hydrogen bonds. Hydrophobic effect, if you stack the bases, it makes the DNA bases uh, recognize it. It's like the benzoic acid in the polyethylene. You see what I mean? Now suddenly, the hydrogen bonds become very selective. Selection is important here. So bulk water, that's the black here, is needed for hydrophobic effect. Now we are approaching the, the answer. Water is needed to keep DNA inside dry. OK. OK. Some people would say this is trivial. I would say I have made a discovery. So role of water in all living systems, hydrophobic effects create bases for cohesive forces, molecular recognition, and, uh, and uh, precise tertiary structures, that's in proteins mainly, needed for function. That holds for DNA, RNA, proteins, and also for membranes. All have a hydrophobic interior, avoiding water. And this is a molecular dynamic simulation of a membrane. That was connection with the, the Nobel Prize for uh, receptors and uh, uh, ion channels. And this is for aquaporin, which is sitting here. Louis Pasteur, he said something. Le sar favorise les prix préparés. Luck is favored by the prepared mind. Of course, it's luck to get the Nobel Prize. It's a luck to make the discovery that is Nobel winning. But you have to understand that you make a discovery. Your mind has to be prepared. You have to have some basic knowledge. So my suggestion is to do that. You just do something you believe in. And this is what I tell uh, my grandchildren. Uh, Ebbe and Emilia, who both are going to be scientists, they think. Thank you.